We've heard a lot throughout the day about various technical challenges, product development considerations, marketing and positioning of plant-based products, business strategy, um, but often for plant-based meat, that's mostly product agnostic. So what we'd like to do in this session uh, is delve into one application area that's near and dear to my heart, and I could not be more thrilled to share the stage to discuss this topic um, with our incredible guest. So uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle has a long rap sheet of accomplishments um, and work throughout her, her uh, esteemed career. So I'll just hit some highlights so we can have an appreciation for the wealth of knowledge and insight that we've got up here. Um, so Dr. Earle is president and chairman of Mission Blue. Uh, she's also founder and president of the Sylvia Earle Alliance, explorer in residence at the National Geographic Society, uh, former chief scientist at NOAA. Um, she's been called terms like a living legend. I, I would agree to that. Her deepness, a hero for the planet. Um, a new one I just heard earlier today. She's like Jacques Cousteau on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sylvia has 27 honorary degrees in addition to her PhD from Duke University. She's led over 100 expeditions and logged over 7,000 hours underwater. Some of those have been at 1,000 meters below the surface. So she is deeply immersed in this environment that we are speaking about. Um, so arguably no one, I would say, has given more thought to our relationship with the ocean um, and how we can preserve its awe-inspiring vibrance. Um, so I'd like to start uh, prefacing this discussion with a talk about some of these projections we hear, predictions we hear. So we hear really dire um, estimates like we'll have fishless o oceans by 2048. Um, so I'd love your perspective on where those numbers are coming from. Should we believe these numbers? How concerned should we be? First you should know that when I was the chief scientist at NOAA, they called me the Sturgeon General. <laughs> <laughs> That's a clue. <laughs> The thought that by 2048 the ocean would be fishless or that by the middle of the of this century there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish in the sea, those are slightly overstated, but it's, it's the trend that more plastic, fewer fish. The end of viable large-scale extraction of wildlife from the sea is likely to happen by the middle of this century. It's already, we've already seen widespread collapse. And the only thing that kind of keeps the fisheries going is that as the supply goes down, the price goes up. So a notorious example was the sale of one bluefin tuna the Tokyo fish market for $1.8 million. It was only 400 pounds. So think about every little piece of sushi with a big fat dollar sign or yen sign on it. So it brings into focus one of the issues we talked about before coming here to the stage, that there is this widespread claim that we must take large quantities of wildlife from the sea related to food security. And you hear many different numbers. It, and it, it's really important not to just swallow these numbers as if, if you see it in print, it's got to be true, or you hear it. Somebody speaks, it's got to be true. Do your homework. Find out how does, how do they, how do they get these numbers that a billion people, or sometimes a quarter of the world's population, you hear that too, rely on the ocean for their either their primary source of protein or their primary source of animal protein or primary source of food or whatever. You know, it's what who really does need to eat ocean wildlife? Well, there are some 
who have few choices, especially in coastal communities that have a long history of relying on the ocean as a source of sustenance. But you can't really justify <laughs> tuna in Chicago as a source of sustenance. The cost, it just doesn't make sense. And, and in terms of calories, most of the calories, as I know it's been said here many times, come from plants anyway. And all the nutrition that you actually need can be derived from plants. Mm -hmm. So food choice is largely what we're talking about when you use the, this crazy term called seafood. What's seafood? <laughs> sea life? Do all animals in the ocean qualify as seafood? What about those others that we don't eat? Are, are they just, they're underutilized and we'll get to them one of these days? Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, long dialogue. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, yeah. How have you seen the strategies change in ocean conservation throughout all of the years that you've been involved in this field? Are we on the right track with strategies like sustainable fisheries management? Is that working? Or do we need to be thinking more boldly and more creatively? One growing cause for hope, I think, is that the value of fish dead, we understand. You can sell a dead fish. What's the value of a live fish in the ocean? What's a whale shark worth swimming in the sea to you? If you've never seen a whale shark, didn't even know they existed. But there is a value, just as there's a value to wild birds or all of nature. They're part of what makes Earth function the way Earth does function. The idea of fish and shrimp and all the other forms of life in the sea getting a, a new label called blue carbon because when plants in the, or the photosynthesizers in the ocean, both plants and those that we don't think of as plants anymore, they're proteases, the little phytoplankton organisms that capture a lot of carbon, generate more than half of the oxygen that we breathe, plus the oxygen that goes into the ocean. Huh. It's, we're now beginning to consider fish as something more than mmm, delicious. <laughs> we're looking at fish as elements of what make the ocean function, what makes our lives possible. If you took all the fish out of the ocean, the, and we've taken quite a lot in a very short period of time, and we have seen the consequences to these disrupted food webs, the nutrient cycles in the sea. Uh, every living thing, not only every living animal consumes, but you also give nutrients back to the system. We humans tend to consolidate the nutrients that we put back. We call it sewage. But in, in the ocean, the fish poop, all right? But, you know, it goes in to fertilize the phytoplankton that captures the carbon, generates the great food webs, and puts oxygen into the atmosphere, keeps this cycle going, keeps us alive in the end. So, all right, so what is a live fish worth? We're just beginning to even think about it because most of the policies in the past have been directed toward how do we take fish out of the ocean and sell them. I got into trouble when I was chief scientist at NOAA because I challenged the, the fisheries contingent of NOAA. It's about a billion dollars a year annual budget as a part of, of NOAA. Um, I said that you know, the accounting base for live fish is zero. How can that be? It's like saying a tree, a live tree, is not worth anything until you cut it up into board feet of lumber. Well, that's how we have valued trees in the past. But we're getting better about looking at the value of not just individual species intact, but whole ecosystems intact. And we're getting there. I think that's the good news. However, the whole concept of fisheries, not fish, but fisheries, which implies you're extracting the fish. 
You're marketing the fish. You're utilizing a resource. Well, I contend that the most important thing that we extract from the ocean has nothing to do with fish or shrimp or lobsters or clams or oysters or oil or gas or sand or whatever else it is that you think we... It, it's our existence. It's our life. And we need to account for that and realize that if we really want to take care of the planet, we have to think differently about life in the ocean. Mm -hmm. You talked about the concept of consumer choice. How do you think plant-based and clean seafood can change the game in terms of giving consumers a new option, a new choice? Well, again, I think we have to think, well, are we trying to do just that, provide a choice, which I think is great? Or are we trying to address the issue of food security? Or is it some of both? Because the way we're going, if in fact we, a lot of people rely on the ocean for their primary source of sustenance, it's actually a relatively small number compared to those who rely on the ocean for food choice. But whatever it is, if we keep doing what we're doing, already the populations of sharks, the hundred, several hundred species of sharks, but the number that are really extracted on a large scale, there's several dozen, but their populations have gone from here, where they were in the 1950s, to about 10% of what they were. And it's a luxury market. So tuna in the Pacific, bluefin tuna, based on the latest figures, an assessment that Barbara Block, uh, whom I trust, scientist at Stanford, under 3% of what was there in the 1970s. So we've seen our capacity to extract from the ocean far exceed the capacity of the creatures in the ocean to maintain, let alone recover from great depletion. So I think there's a tremendous place here for getting people to, you know, if, if they, they have this acquired taste for shrimp or lobster or, or tuna or swordfish, whatever, to give them that acquired taste without killing the animals in the sea, protecting that. If it's for other reasons that, you know, we, you want to provide a tasty source of protein other than plant material, then the idea of the clean meat. I, I remember hearing about cell cultivation when I was a student many years ago, an undergraduate. Yeah, the very idea that you could take a few cells from an orange and maybe get orange juice without a tree. <laughs> what a concept. To be able to take a few cells from a tuna and actually get tuna meat or beef or whatever it is without having the whole animal. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating concept and one that we really ought to be embracing. Yeah. Very well said. Um, so there are quite a few things that I think are very distinct about the seafood industry relative to terrestrial animal agriculture, which is mostly what we've been talking about so far today. Uh, one of those is, as you just mentioned, the ratio of wild caught to farmed, essentially all of the terrestrial animal meat we eat today is farmed, very small fraction is wild caught, uh, whereas we're at a, a really interesting moment in history right now where in the oceans, it's about 50-50, 50% 50, 50%, um, 50 from farmed fish, aquacultured fish. Uh, and shrimp, and, and, and oysters, and correct. clams. And, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think that's really unique. There's another concept that I think is uh, uniquely pertinent to the seafood space that, that probably most folks aren't very familiar with um, or don't think much about, but it's, it's critical here. And that's the concept of trophic levels. 
Um, so could you tell us what, what does a trophic level mean uh, and, and what are the implications of eating animals high up on the food chain, like tuna, swordfish, <laughs> some of these um, really high demand foods? It's glossed over in most assessments of what we extract from the ocean. Um, even in my beloved National Geographic, there has, it, about a year ago, I guess, a whole series on food where they were looking at what it takes to make a cow, what it takes to make a chicken, what it takes to make a fish. <laughs> There's 33,000 kinds of fish. <laughs> There's one kind, one species that represents cow, beef. And basically, oh, there are lots of variations on the theme of chicken, but like cats and dogs, it's basically one kind of highly variable species. But fish, oh my goodness, are you talking about a catfish or are you talking about a tuna fish? <laughs> if you're talking about a catfish, and even there, there are several hundred variations on the theme of what we loosely call catfish. But the one that is most often grown, cultivated, is a North American species that is extracted from the Mississippi River. They are mostly plant eaters, like cows, like chickens, like most of the animals that we cultivate. They're grazers. They are Sunlight plants animal. And mostly for cultivated animals, we take them when they're very young. We don't eat 15-year-old chickens. <laughs> we try to get them to grow as fast as possible because it's efficient. The conversion ratio from sunlight to plants to Kentucky Fried has got to be as short as possible, right? Or beef. Or you don't we we don't eat old sheep, we eat Lamb. Why? It's not just because it's tender, it's because it's cost effective. Again, sunlight plants animal. In the ocean, tuna. Sunlight, little tiny plants, itsy bitsy, prochlorococcus, <laughs> or whatever it is, diatoms that feed the copepods and other creatures. So the this, this zoo of, of zooplankton, the larval stages of lots of creatures that feed low on the food chain, and they feed on one another. And so, you know, you can get to 10 stages in the food chain and still wind up with a creature that is really tiny. Huh. Every step of the way, you know, the rule of thumb is you burn up about 90% of the calories that you consume and you retain maybe 10%. It's a variable figure, but the thing is, you burn most of what you consume and the rest is either not digested, it is just excreted, or it's, you know, you, you consume that much, but only 10% is actually retained, more or less. Anyway, in this rapid growing stage. So if you do crunch the numbers, about a, two pounds of plants for a pound of chicken, and it varies, of course, on lots of different things, but maybe 20 pounds of plants to make a pound of cow. How, old or young you take that animal, uh, how much they've exercised and burned off at being a cow is another issue. H how many calories have gone to each and every one of you to make <laughs> what you have? Think of all those Thanksgiving dinners and big, well, whatever it is you eat. <laughs> 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 but if you really look at it, to make a, not a one-year-old tuna, because nobody except fish in the sea eat one-year-old tunas, it's usually, a, you know, to get a 10-year-old tuna that fishermen will pay any attention to, it's, it's a kind of a biggish fish, 10 years, but they can live to be 30 years old. But you take them when they're still relatively young, still growing, but they've already had invested thousands of pounds of phytoplankton at the other end of this long and twisted food chain. So, 100,000 pounds to make a 10-year-old tuna? starting at the bottom of the food chain, if you really account for the cost out of the ecosystem, it's a pretty expensive choice. And, you know, maybe $1.8 million is about right for every tuna, but in fact, no. 
we, we think of fish as free. Free goods, there for us to extract. Not really thinking about not only what it has taken out of the system, this long tail of groceries that have been invested in every swordfish, in every halibut, in every cod or grouper or snapper, or 20-year-old lobster. I mean, most lobsters, going to the invertebrate side of things, here in California, or even the warm water species, it's about five years of groceries to get to uh, one that will be suitable for human dining. There are a lot of other creatures out there that love lobster when they're really small. That's the thing, you know, that most of what is taken in wild systems is the, the small, the, the little guys, the, the rapidly growing, the, the eggs, the, the larvae, the small things, uh, and small fish. They're, they're just, you know, it's a dangerous place to be if you're small in the ocean. Everybody wants to eat you, <laughs> sometimes including your parents. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> so I, th I think this concept is really underappreciated. And what I love about plant-based seafood and clean seafood is that it gives us the opportunity to level the trophic playing field. Yeah. It takes basically the same amount of resources to make a plant-based product that tastes like tuna as to make one that tastes like a sardine, right? It's just different flavorings that you're adding, different textures. Um, same with clean seafood. You know, you're feeding cells directly, so there's not this long tail of groceries, I love that <laughs> phrase. Um, really fascinating. So I'd like to ask you, who does this industry need to involve? So we've seen on, on the terrestrial meat side of things, the traditional meat industry has been getting involved, both in terms of investment um, and really you know, making meaningful uh, strides towards rebranding as protein companies. Do you think we'll see that on the seafood side of things, or is there a whole host of new characters that we need to bring into this emerging industry? I think it really involves, really involves all of us. And I think there's a lot of resistance right now to the idea that, that fishing as an enterprise, large-scale commercial fishing, is something that we have to get away from. There's a lot of resistance, partly because there's this huge investment that people, fisheries scientists, have got stuck in their head that fish are to be, quotes, utilized. And it's the dead fish syndrome, <laughs> not looking at the value, the importance of live fish to a healthy ocean and therefore back to us. That the ocean needs fish. How much do we actually need to eat fish? It is mostly a choice. And it's, a, you know, for those who have few choices about what to consume and living somehow in harmony with their oceanic back backyard, which is true in many island communities, coastal communities. I've just come from Martha's Vineyard, and I sat down just yesterday with uh, some of the local fishermen who really do go back generations. Some of them go back to the Native Americans that we're talking now thousands of years, and they've lived with a kind of give and take. They, they try to find, the, they, they know that they're their existence, their sustenance, really depends on taking care of the ocean, not taking too much, avoiding taking the fish when they're making more fish. I mean, that's like, duh. <laughs> Why would you take spawning lobsters and spawning fish? They, I mean, they, they learn these things because they have to. But the large-scale extraction of wildlife, not connected to family, not connected to community, not connected really. The, fish, the high seas fishing that is currently stripping the ocean of so much wildlife that, that has never known the bite of a hook 
were a net until the latter part of the 20th century when we gained access to areas beyond coastal regions. And now um, nations, a number of nations in particular, about a dozen, are invested in extracting. They're not connected to making not just a, a, a livelihood or living, but a life. And it's no, no deep history, no connection. So I think we have to have many ways of looking at this. That, that if we can cut back on, and we just must, either we will by choice, by decision, or as you look at the projections, look at what tuna are doing, collapsing, what are cod doing, like this, sharks, <laughs> the rockfish here in California, number of species, all of them unfortunately taste good, <laughs> but all of them grow slowly, they're all carnivores, and it's a pricey fish if you eat rockfish, if, if you eat a, lo a lot of the ocean wildlife, they're, they're mostly carnivores, and a big investment, so, I think if people just understand, if they know what they're eating when they eat a piece of halibut, mmm, delicious, but what's the real cost of that wild creature? And can I enjoy the taste of halibut? Well, you know, is it lemon, or is it onion, or is it garlic, or is it rosemary? You can make some of these things like tilapia, taste like whatever you want it to taste like. Uh, so it's not the, actually, there is something about the texture and the oiliness of a tuna and salmon. Oh, don't get me started on salmon. But <laughs> this many wild fish to make this many farm fish. I mean, it's not a very good business model if so, you're thinking about the real cost. Mm -hmm. So we need to market to the public we need to really get to the fishermen and work with them and listen to them. The, the, the people such as those in little island countries such as Palau who are reliant on local fish, or Martha's Vineyard, long history there. Gulf of Mexico, the people who have, again, a deep vested history, and here in California. But what the real market is not with the communities and the families. It's people. It's, it's we, we've been sold the concept that seafood, quotes, is fish are good for you. We've got a better choice than beef. We need to get to the truth of the matter and have choices that really do fulfill that wish. It is healthy. It is good for you. It, it doesn't have mercury or fire retardant. I mean, you're going to miss that tasty little bit of, of uh, <laughs> fire retardant in your <laughs> sardines mm -hmm. or whatever. I was on the Colbert Report once upon a time, and he said, if I have to stop eating tuna, how am I going to get my mercury then? You know? <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing I'm sure you, you know, it, probably many folks in this room realize, but probably the general public does not, is that something like omega-3 fatty acids actually come from algae, and fish only fish accumulate eat them. them because they don't they're make eating them. algae. So. We can bypass the fish, and there are a number of com companies that already are doing that, growing the plankton. And again, you're going to miss that little ding of whatever your favorite contaminant is. <laughs> so two more quick questions for you. One, at our reception in just a moment, we're going to have plant-based versions of tuna from two mm -hmm. different companies. I know we've talked a lot about the ecological impact of these top predators like tuna. What other product would you love to see a plant-based or clean version of on the market? Well, why do we eat what we eat now? I mean, what do we eat now that wasn't being eaten 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago? I think it's safe to say it's marketing. 
when I was a kid, tuna was fed to the cats and dogs. Nobody would eat tuna. Bluefin tuna? Yeah, you know. It was one of the cheapest fish in the Boston markets because nobody ate it until it got the marketing and actually the fish, the, like the big tuna, bluefin especially, were sent to where there was a market and there was a taste for it already, and that's Japan. Um, I think crab across the board would be a great choice because already <laughs> you take um, Alaskan pollock, which is, a, again, a top predator, and it lives a long time. It's really expensive to take them out of the ecosystem because you're taking somebody that each, each fish has a big investment in it, and you don't sell it as a pollock, you sell it as crab meat, surimi or whatever it is. You, they juice it up so it tastes like something that can be sold for more money. Uh, much of the crab that meat that is sold, you, you do, get, do get crab legs, you do like lobster claws, but most, a lot of it is just the taste of the crab, whether it's in a salad, little flaky bits, or in, in a chowder or whatever, a taste of crab. So I think that would be one of the better choices. Take note, entrepreneurs. <laughs> So my, my closing question for you, we've got a room full uh, of... But, but let me just, one last thing. Sure. So we just need to market things because they do taste good. We can create these really cool foods that are really good for you, and they taste wonderful. And whether you slather them with a plant-based mayo or you... Um, whatever it is, our job, I think, is to convince people, the public at large, that th this is a really cool idea. And, and that's, how we, that's why we eat tuna. That's why we eat... Whoever would, who was the first person who ever ate an oyster? <laughs> it had to have been really hungry. <laughs> but we have an acquired taste for oyster now because it's the, you know, the... That's a sexy thing to do. I mean, literally, eat oysters, <laughs> eat fish, live longer, eat oysters, love longer, right? <laughs> that's what they say. <laughs> anyway, so that's our job, is to create really good food, create really good sustainable food. I don't see how we can justify calling wildlife sustainable on a large scale any more than we could do it for, for songbirds or for eagles, or for owls. But this new way of looking at what we consume is, is so 21st century. I mean, let's get with it. Huh. It's what we really need for true food security. We won't have food security by taking these ancient creatures from the sea and disrupting the chemistry of the ocean in the process. So you have one more question. Can my, we do it fast? Yes, my <laughs> final question, and I think you already have, have done this to a large degree, but we've got a room full of so many different people, researchers, students, entrepreneurs, journalists, industry leaders. What's your call to action for this audience? They've come here looking for inspiration for how they contribute their next step to a good food future. What's your call to action? Go for it. <laughs> I mean, like, this, seriously, this is the moment in time. I mean, years ago, I, maybe some of you have read Arthur C. Clarke's story where this crew, they're somewhere in space, and they decide they're going to have a steak dinner with broccoli and mashed potatoes and whatever it is. And so they go to the big machine that's loaded with carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and sulfur and phosphorus and all the elements that we are known to exist, and they, you know, turn a few dials and push a few buttons and sit and wait <laughs> and ka -ching! out comes their dinner all cooked and ready to go from the basic elements. Well, we're not quite there yet, but the idea that we can be intelligent about what we consume, what do we need? 
it doesn't have to be just bland mush as nutrient rich something. I mean, the idea of taking, you know, tablets or pills or crackers that don't taste good, but they are really nutritious. No, let's make it smart. Make it taste good. Make it, we need to talk to the chefs of the world and make it really high end, but also for school kids, that, that they enjoy having the lunch that we can collectively provide by intelligent use of the materials that are there that don't kill the earth in the process of keeping us alive. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for sharing your insights. Thank you.